Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tyg Sullivan Knudsen, and this is the future of healthcare IoT. What I'm going to talk about today and how we're going to start is we're going to start off with the newcomers to healthcare IoT communications. We're going to explore how they affect the healthcare enterprise, and with a few select examples, we're going to showcase technical innovation in action. We're then going to venture to the future of healthcare communications, 5G, and how its novel and unique aspects and attributes are able to solve some of healthcare's most pressing issues. Finally, we'll take a sharp look at a comprehensive IoT platform and what that really means. We're going to talk about the issues and situations that you face as healthcare leaders and decision makers. And finally, cap it off with how we can work together to architect the future of healthcare IoT. But before we jump to bright horizons, I'd like to, I'd like to ground us in the present and where we may be right now. So to start off with, let's talk about two communication protocols from AT&T. We'll start off with LTEM. This is a payload slash communication protocol that is specific for healthcare IoT in any type of application. The SIM cards that are used are one-sixth the size of your average SIM card so that device makers can make smaller, more efficient devices with the hardware that they may need to have in there. The cost is low. It's a very small machine-to-machine -machine data package for any type of innovation that you may need to procure. The extended battery life, and you know, the, don't, don't gloss at this quickly, it's a 10-year extended battery life for any SIM that we put out there. So 10 years lifespan on any product that you put out. The biggest factor for me in the healthcare enterprise is the subterranean, the ability to penetrate subterranean, so that's radiology, any other business units that you may have as a hospital provider or anywhere else in the healthcare ecosystem that goes underground. But not only that, but it's also able to penetrate lead walls as well as thicker walls where signal may not be able to penetrate before that. The biggest part of this is the consumer is not bound to the four walls of a hospital, nor really even their home in that matter. It has 7x coverage, and it's able to leverage the largest global telecommunications network in the world. Let's move to FirstNet. FirstNet is a network for first responders. When I think first responders, think police, fire, emergency medical services, as well as healthcare providers. This came about after the 2001 tragedy in New York that we all know as 9-11. After that, the government mandated that there had to be a network that would service the first net responders for that amount, for any first responder, so that in times of crisis, even the more modern ones, such as Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Katrina, and the Boston bombing, that our first responders would never be in a situation where they did not have connectivity with one another to address and to help and to care for the communities in which they serve. AT&T was awarded this contract a few years ago to the tune of $6.5 billion. We've pledged an additional $40 billion in order to grow our infrastructure to serve those first responders who they're in for serve our communities. You know, it's, I, we get caught up in, you know, I'm talking about communication, emerging communication protocols here, but it's hard to really understand and present and demonstrate because they're non-tangible. You can't see them. So what we do at, at, in Houston, Texas, at our AT&T Healthcare Foundry, is we work with trailblazing firms, the pioneers of our industry, to solve the most pertinent and most pressing healthcare problems with our premier technical talent, as well as our emerging communication protocols, like our work with IRA. So IRA came to us, and what they do is they create a product that enables the day-to-day -day tasks that were previously unaccessible to the low vision and the blind. We work with them first off to start off by using it in order to read off prescription labels from bottles using machine learning algorithms that we procured over time. Over time, the use cases exploded and we now use the IRA infrastructure to use the camera on the front of the lens, which then takes the feed back to a live agent on the back end, which then brings it back to the speaker on the side of the glasses and therefore interprets in a language accessibly to the person using it. Thank you so much, Rachel. And to that note, we have an individual named Eric who has been leveraging the IRA glasses for quite some time and pushing the boundaries of the device that, and the solution that we created so long ago. 
Last year, he completed the Boston Marathon. He's a low, low vision individual, but completed the Boston Marathon with these glasses, but he's not done there. He's going to go and compete in Ironman Kona, which is the triathlon of all triathlons, the championship in this October. So I think I speak for all of us when I say, let's go, Eric. Hanger, another use case. It was Hanger came to us. They're a leader in prosthetics and orthotics. And they came to us with a problem of connecting deeper with their patients in which they prescribed, which were prescribed the hanger prosthetic. The issue was, was the individuals who were prescribed had a hard time using the prosthetic. Maybe they, didn't, they had troubles adhering to the care plan. And sometimes, in the worst of cases, they stopped following the care plan and stopped using the prosthetic altogether. What AT&T did was we worked with Hanger in order to strap sensors on to the device so that we may do predictive maintenance and quality if the prosthetic needed some maintenance. More importantly, leveraging the, the sensor data and that data in order to dynamically intervene if the prosthetic wasn't being used so that we can communicate with the patient. But most importantly, we leveraged the platform, the data, in order to create a mobile application to connect Hanger directly to the patients in order to create that connection in order to facilitate this product. Thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate it. So I just want to take a quick second here and talk about 5G. We're now at the future, and what we're looking at is the future. This is the first slide that I saw coming in and really acknowledging how large the 5G wave revolution, whatever you want to call it, was going to be, and it was upon us, and how it applied to healthcare. This is the first slide that really knocks you out of, your, knocks you out of the chair. For the novel applications that I mentioned earlier, what are you using 5G for in the healthcare enterprise? Massive device connectivity. We're going from 20 million to 20 billion devices by 2020. The ultra low latency. Sometimes we're talking one to five milliseconds of latency, which opens up a whole nother door of clinical applications that were previously unrealized. The ultra reliability. This is what makes it critical in the clinical setting for you to run those critical applications. We're talking five nines of reliability over the air via cellular. Better capacity, 20 gigs plus. With the ultra high speeds, we're able to handle any types of data feeds that may come from an entire enterprise. Hell, you could even run your entire enterprise off 5G if you chose to. I wouldn't recommend it, but theoretically it is possible. Uh, an announcement that came out this morning, actually, and I'm just going to reiterate it, was our partnership with Rush Medical in Chicago, Illinois. We're working with CIO Dr. Rob Shafiq in order to make and help in, enable Rush Medical to be the first standards-based 5G hospital in America. So what does that mean? You know, I get this question a lot. How do you explain 5G quickly and briefly? I want you to think, and there was another baking example on the last presentation, but think of 5G as a cookie. There's dough and there's chocolate chips. I want you to think of 5G coverage as the dough. Spread dough all over the uh, campus, enterprise, whatever type of organization it may be. Then you sprinkle in the chocolate chips. We're going to call those millimeter wave. That's where you get the speeds, the feeds, and the true novelty in 5G. And that's what we're going to do with Rush in order to enable 5G use cases. What are some 5G use cases that you could expect to see in the near future? Let's talk about entertainment and pain management. There was a study that came out that said a 30% decrease in pain if one were to experience a VR experience as opposed to being prescribed opioids. It'd be a great alternative to the opioids that were prescribed there. Also offering end of life experiences where some individuals, war individuals, wanted to experience, you know, a Navy fly, a, a Navy a cruise ship again, or an Air Force flyover. We're able to provide those experiences to end, near life, end of life individuals. Um, high resolution image transfer. In healthcare, this one rings true. I, I talk about this one all the time. This is those large radiology image files that need to be pushed over, over during the daytime, and they can't wait till the evening because patients' care plans are not being sent over quickly enough. What we're able to do is we're able to send it over CLAN, cellular land, and we're able to have it over there, you know, 20 gigs of the feeds in real time, get it over to the care plan, get that done with. Healthcare managed data platform, we're able to strap location on top of all the payloads that are coming over. You can extrapolate there and take the use cases from there on what you're able to do. And then for the first time, enabling real time machine learning via, on, think of it as edge computing or multi access edge compute is what we call it, but going over there and adjudicating at the edge quickly 
these payloads so that you're able to have real time machine learning algorithms as well as neural nets. We're practicing it right now and we're, we're piloting a little bit of this, but we're going in and we're looking at image recognition, speech recognition, and some of the more, some of the use cases that need a little bit of lower latency in order to go quickly. So finally, I'm gonna wrap it up here with a comprehensive look at an IoT platform. In my view, in AT&T's view, what we see an end-to-end -end IoT platform solution, what that looks like. You're gonna start with connected devices or connected assets here over there on the left. You're gonna to move to a cellular network because you need to connect those devices. Wi-Fi, it's not going to be able to sustain and really your IT department doesn't like carving up VLANs time after time for business unit after business unit for these point solutions that have already been procured and the only person who signed off was a line of business unit who has no relation to the IT and the infrastructure in order to create sustainable solutions that run on a manageable platform. You're gonna need service delivery. If you're a global company, you're gonna need even more service delivery. I want you to think of SIM cards that may be activated via AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, our, our friends overseas, you're going to need to manage all these SIMs. You know, you can't have one proprietary platform. You have to have one single platform that looks across the scope. And then you're gonna to need to push this information to cloud solution providers. You may have your own on-campus data center, but for this example, push it to the cloud solution providers in a HIPAA and high, in, a, in an environment infrastructure that supports HIPAA and high-tech compliance, and then build the applications out. Predictive maintenance and quality, asset tracking, population health management, and predictive health analytics in order to derive value out of the assets that you have procured. Some issues that I just wanna state up front that you have to pay attention to when you're looking at healthcare for IoT. Security is a massive issue. I can't tell you how many operating systems there are that run these IoT devices, let alone we barely have a standardized format for these IoT payloads to run through. You need to have consulting there. For the management of it, I touched on it earlier, but when you procure all these solutions via various lines of business, they have to be standardized. This cannot scale. You have to have a platform in order to manage the scope and the breadth of all the devices that you're going to procure for your particular organization. Finally, and probably the biggest problem that I face in my day in consulting clients and how to bring these solutions to life is a disconnected value chain. Bringing together providers, payers, pharmaceuticals, and medical device manufacturers is not easy. And you have to do this in order to get reimbursed for the solutions that you plan to push out to market. Otherwise, you're never getting paid. It's not a sustainable business model. We at AT&T relish the opportunity in order to do just this. We're a Fortune 10 company. We have these relationships. We look forward to architecting these types of solutions, bringing individuals together to further improve the outcomes and the outlook for our patients and the lives that we treat. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for their attendance. I really appreciate the time and having the opportunity here at CES. Um, I'd like to thank both Ms. Edmondson and Ms. Ellert for their cooperation. And we are here for another five to 10 minutes. We'd love to answer any questions. If you wanna take this offline, we got a great booth over at 43... 519. 519. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much.